is to achieve the honor of being the first to reach the South Pole. A groundbreaking documentary crafted from the real life accounts of those who lived it. Words of Captain Scott, Friday at 10.35, ITV1. Schools shut as teachers walk out and march through London in a row over pensions. I don't think we should be able to have to work until we're 68 years old. It's not going to be good for schools, it's not going to be good for students. I mean, where's the fair deal in that? 60% of London schools were affected by the walkout with disruption to families across the capital. Also tonight, firefighters warn the dry weather will spark more wildfires like this. A thousand dead fish are pulled from a lake, baffling the experts. And why was Rihanna so excited? The pop star tells us what she loves about London. This is London Tonight with Natasha Kaplinsky. Hello, good evening. Thousands of teachers from London marched through the capital today, leaving 60% of schools closed or partially closed. Members of the National Union of Teachers and the University and College Union went on strike to protest against the government's public sector pension reforms. They claim they'll be paying more and working longer. But as Glenn Goodman reports, today's walkout was met with anger from some parents who had to deal with disruption to their day. I think it's absolutely outrageous. They are, they are angry. Oh, real, real anger about this. The teachers refuse to give in. The government has asked them to contribute more money to their pensions and to retire later. And they're not having any of it. They are massively angry with what the government's doing. It's not sensible for a government that wants to bring about changes in education to so alienate the people who work in the system. They have to make further changes. So if the teachers won't back down, perhaps the government will. The teacher's pension is still one of the best available and nobody within 10 years of retirement will be affected by these reforms. Um, but there does have to be reforms as people are living longer and as a consequence a defined benefit pension is very costly. So the government won't back down either. They say the National Union of Teachers and the University and College Union are all on their own in taking today's action. Now the demonstrators have walked all the way through Westminster to here in Great Smith Street where they're situated outside the Department for Education. The NUT say that up to 10,000 people joined today's march. According to government figures, 60% of London schools, around 1,450 in total, have been forced to close or partially close today. And the UCU say that 47 colleges and 16 universities have also been affected. Some parents feel they've been left in the lurch. That's enough of that now. Helen Tyndale owns the Nice Green Cafe in Camden. She had no option but to work at the cafe while also looking after her eight-year-old son, Fabian. I find it annoying. I've had to bring my son to work today. I am self-employed. I run my own business. Uh, I'm a single parent of two children. Um, but I don't strike. I don't have a pension. I don't have cradle-to-grave benefits. Helen feels the strikes unintentionally target the wrong people, that parents like her feel the pain even if the government don't. So would the unions consider changing their strategy? I think you can be certain that there'll be further industrial action. We're not telling at the moment what the plans for that are, but we're, our complete intention is that this campaign isn't going away. So it looks like a stalemate. The government won't budge, so the strikes will go on. Glenn Goodman, London Tonight, Westminster. The Prime Minister said today that Britain's priority is to keep people safe during the Olympics. With 121 days to go, David Cameron was speaking at Downing Street along with the President of the International Olympics Committee and the boss of London 2012. As Sally Williams now reports, the three of them are feeling optimistic that London is ready for the Games. To conclude, Prime Minister, we are a happy International Olympic Committee. Thank you very much. Well, if you're happy, I'm happy. Um, Seb. Are you happy? I'm delirious, Prime Minister. Um, you couldn't see it, but you could certainly sense it. The mutual slapping of backs. The Prime Minister so happy with Jacques Rogge's remarks, he was quoting them himself. Jacques, as you said uh, very kindly, in London, the Olympic movement is finding a legacy blueprint 
for future games. Mr Rogg was treated to a cabinet meeting before gathering in private where security was the top priority. This will be the biggest and the most integrated security operation in mainland Britain in our peacetime history. But any concerns Londoners may share about that or transport were not shared by the IOC. Well, we have no doubts whatsoever in these two fields. Thank you. It was a commendably short answer. I must remember to try, uh, try some of those. It's never easy playing in a suit. Oh. But David Cameron was keen to look at legacy today, launching the first school's Olympics. On top of that and other measures, the Prime Minister said a billion pounds will go into youth sport. But is that enough to convince former Olympians of a lasting legacy? Former Olympians who not much more than a year ago were so critical of the government for slashing the funding into the school sports partnership. Um, yes, I was very disappointed earlier last year when we saw a lot of the funding cut. But we have to look forward. Um, it's a new era. Um, we have the Olympic Games around the corner and we have to have the promises kept, which is to galvanise, to make sure that uh, young people have the opportunity to participate. And do you believe those promises will be kept, Denise? I, they have to be. As I say, this is a first step, so it would be wrong to criticise anybody for taking a first step. So let's see what happens in the second and third. Jack Rogg seemed free from fear on legacy today. There is already, before the Games even begin, a great legacy in East London. But the Prime Minister has admitted while much has been done, there is much still to do. Sally Williams, London Tonight at the Olympic Park. More than a dozen protesters have set up camp at an Olympic site where basketball players will practice for the Games. Building work at the site in Leighton Marsh in Lee Valley has stopped for the time being. Well, Dan Hewitt is there for us this evening. So, Dan, what more can you tell us? Well, you're right, it is embarrassing for David Cameron on a day when he said the Olympic security is top priority. Now, the protesters behind me have been here for a while. They're from the uh, group to protect Leighton Marsh, but they've been joined by the group from Occupy, who you may uh, remember from their protest uh, outside St Paul's that was cleaned up a few, uh, few months ago. Now, this is what where they said when I asked them, why are they here? There's plenty of facilities locally, Kelmscott Leisure Centre, the Walthamstow Dog Track, uh, the Score Centre in Leighton, which could be used as alternatives, brought up to the same scratch, the same standard that the Olympics require, uh, to benefit the local community. That doesn't mean that people can't come here and not enjoy this beautiful uh, lung of London, green yeah. lung of London, you know? Well, Lee Valley do stress that this uh, behind me is it's a temporary construction. It's not going to be here forever. Now, uh, the construction has stopped here at the moment. Now, this is reasonably embarrassing when you think this is going to be where the American basketball team would have come, the multi-millionaires with America. That doesn't look like it's happening anytime soon. So looking ahead, uh, construction has stopped. The protesters aren't going anywhere. Uh, so it doesn't look like it's going to get built uh, anytime soon. Thank you, Dan. With scorching temperatures and lack of rain, firefighters are warning there could be an increase in wildfires across London and the southeast. Over the weekend, 70 acres of Heathland was devastated after a fire at Ashdown Forest near East Grinstead. And yesterday, the UK's largest cemetery was on fire. Around 40 firefighters tackled the flames at Brookwood Cemetery near Woking. Well, Sharon Thomas was there this evening. Sharon. Well, Brooklyn Cemetery is the largest cemetery in Western Europe. In fact, when it was built back in 1854, it was the largest in the world. And it was primarily built to house an overspill in the dead from London, who were coming here on funeral trains almost daily. It's set in 450 acres of beautiful parkland, but as you can see, around 17 of which were destroyed by the fire yesterday. Well, I'm joined now from Surrey Fire and Rescue by Gavin Watts. Gavin, these extraordinary weather conditions we're seeing here in March, how much did that affect your blaze here yesterday? Today. It really has made a huge difference. It's so early on in the year. We, we plan and prepare for these things, but so we have to say this fire is unusually early. And are we likely to see more such incidents if these conditions continue? I'm afraid with the drought and the, game, the, the warm weather, which we all enjoy, we, we're, we're very concerned that actually we will see a rise in this type of wildfire, as we call it. So we would urge people to be very careful as they go about their business and indeed their pleasure. And what sort of advice would you give to people in order to avoid, you know, setting a light to somewhere accidentally that could cause a devastating blaze? Be very, very careful with, with any, any naked flame, so uh, cigarettes, uh, the, the barbecues that people enjoy these days so much. And if they do find anything, do see any fire, they must call us immediately and give us the best chance possible to deal with it. 
OK, Gavin, thank you very much indeed. Well, I've just got one more thing to show you. You've got 30,000 graves here at Brooklands. This is just one of them. Fortunately, this one's made of granite, so it hasn't really been affected by the fire. It may have some discoloration over time. This one dates from about 1932. But what they're really hoping for now is some rain to get this parched earth back to where it was so this heathland can start growing again. Sharon, thank you very much. Now, nominations for next Mayor of London closed today, but campaigning is already well underway. Boris Johnson was out in Harrow to promote more investment for high streets. Meanwhile, Green Party candidate Jenny Jones officially endorsed Labour's Ken Livingstone for her second preference vote. Both candidates spoke to around 70 members of the Green Party's headquarters in central London. And the former Deputy Met Police Commissioner Bram Paddock launched his campaign bus in Camden. Liberal Democrat candidate is proposing one-hour tickets on buses instead of a single fare for each journey. If you have to change buses to get to your destination, you don't have to pay twice. You don't do that on the tube, why should you do it on the buses? Well, London goes to the polls on May the 3rd. A full list of all the candidates will be available on Friday. A three-year-old boy has had his leg broken as robbers tried to snatch his mother's handbag. The attack happened in Haringey on Monday. Two teenagers have been charged. One of them is also accused of assaulting a police community support officer. At least 1,000 dead fish have been pulled from a lake in Bexley Heath, but no one knows what's killing them. The Environment Agency say they've tested the water at Danson Lake and it's clean, so it's believed the fish are dying from a mystery disease. Marcus Powell has more. For families and sightseers, this is a beautiful boating lake, but beneath the surface it's littered with the bodies of the dead and the dying. Specimen fish are dying in their hundreds, carp killed apparently by a deadly, as yet unidentified, disease. But the sight and stench of rotting fish is upsetting many of the locals. It's like a massacre. They were, you know, there was masses of them in, in areas, not all over the pond, obviously, but over there was horrendous. And this is on a sunny there. weekend? Yeah. With lots of people? Yeah. And kids feeding the ducks, and kids running back saying, Mummy, there's a dead fish. That's not nice. As we've walked along, we've seen quite a few dead fish. And as we've walked up further to come and feed the ducks, there's absolutely loads of dead fish, and it smells quite a lot as well. We come in regularly. It's quite nice to do it with the children. And today, it's just been quite a shame, actually. It's hard to explain, isn't it? Bexley Council have arranged for water sports staff to clear the dead fish daily, but today's haul was at least 30 bodies. Scores more lie in the water, and many others are clearly suffering, consumed by the disease. It is something that sometimes happens at this time of the year, but it, yes, it is very sad, and obviously there are a number of carp that are affected. Damage limitation, perhaps. Meanwhile, the Environment Agency is struggling. They know it's not pollution killing the fish, but they don't know what is. Well, tests are ongoing at the moment. Um, we're waiting for the results to come back, but as the fact that it's particular, there's just one species of fish that's actually sort of died in this case, which is carp. Um, we're fairly confident it's, uh, it's sort of specific to that species, yeah. While one species problem is another one's free lunch, the Environment Agency must act fast, as at the moment this beauty spot is being blighted. Marcus Powell, London Tonight, Bexley Heath. Still to come tonight, will they pass inspection? The Household Cavalry start preparations for the Queen's Diamond Jubilee. And how the whole of London will be affected when they hit this switch next week. The Football Association has launched an investigation after a brawl broke out on the pitch at Crawley's match in Bradford last night. Players from both teams were involved in the fight, which happened just after the final whistle. The referee then saw the teams in the dressing room and showed red cards to three players from Bradford and two from Crawley. However, the FA could take further action. Now next, it became known as the Wall of Love. After the London riots, hundreds of people gathered at uh, boarded up shops in Peckham to express their frustration about the trouble, the violence taking place on their doorstep. Soon, post-its covered the Poundland store with messages of love and peace. The wall became a symbol of unity and hope. Well, now a singer called Jamie West from Tooting has written a song about it. I knew these streets like a driver in his homeland Now my land is burning, I can't seem to get around I don't want it to be like this I don't want it to feel like this Everybody here has a right to exist So, oh, put your love letters up on this wall Oh, put your love letters up 
very pleased to say that Jamie's with us in the studio. Great to see you, Jamie. Thank you very much for coming in. It's a very catchy tune. It's wonderful. Oh, thank you. Um, there can't be many songwriters, though, that have written a song about a wall. <laughs> what inspired you? I a guess very so. special wall. Yeah, I mean, when I uh, saw the story about the post-it walls that people had done, I thought that it just lent itself to a song because it was so uplifting in the face of what was quite you know, frightening events. Mm. So I saw that and thought, this is a good turnaround. That's right. I mean, you've said, haven't you, that you wanted to address the riots in a positive and an uplifting way. Was there one particular message on the wall or when you were researching your song that you actually were really struck by and that you thought struck a chord? I think a lot of them were, it was more the collection together of so many creative people. So I thought that it was people, why they liked the town that they lived in. And um, in the song, putting it out, I wanted to make sure that um, we weren't saying that the rioters were bad. We were saying that the rioting behavior is bad. It's not about us versus them. We only have us. Mm. So um, all the messages seemed to come together and support that in the video when we recreated the wall. It was um, quite special. I bet it was. What hope do you think then your song will give people? I think that it's one of those kind of, I wanted to try and write an anthemic type song that people could all get behind and sing along with but didn't ignore the issues. And I hope that whoever was touched by those events in the London riots that they would um, take something positive and realise that there's other people out there mm. together and we can work together. Well, you've had a very interesting life so far, haven't you? You were busker of the year, weren't you, in 2009 and yeah. now this. So we look forward to waiting and seeing what your next move is. So yeah. thank you very much indeed, Jamie, for coming in and My talking pleasure. to us and sharing your music. It was great. Thank you. Thanks. Now, in a week's time, you could be watching TV and your screen will just go blank. Digital UK is warning that a million homes in the capital still rely on the old analogue si signal. Now, the digital switchover happens from next Wednesday, April the 4th, and the change is made from a transmitter in Crystal Palace. From there, Nick Thatcher has more. It's been a symbol of television in London since the 1950s and the giant Crystal Palace transmitter beams programmes into millions of homes across the capital and beyond. But over the next few weeks, the analogue channels broadcast from here will be turned off and up to a million TV sets could be left with blank screens. As we know, most people already have digital on their main TV sets, but it's important to remember that set in your bedroom, in the children's bedroom, in the kitchen, in the conservatory. Every single set has to be ready to receive the digital signal. Digital switchover in London promises to bring with it an increase in signal strength and free view services for 400,000 more homes. So in the old transmission suite, the first of the five analogue channels will be turned off next Wednesday and the rest will go on April the 18th. Analogue ITV1 disappears from our screens in just three weeks time and it's the job of someone here at the Crystal Palace transmitter to pull this lever and signal the end. It's a very exciting time for us here at Crystal Palace. Uh, we've been building the, uh, the new DSO transmitters for the last two years and the antenna system. So I get to do the fun bit at the end, um, to flick the switch, um, turn off the analog services and bring on for the first time the high powered digital services. Of course, digital television received through satellite or cable services is not affected by the changes. But if you have Freeview, you'll need to retune your set-top box or television on Wednesday the 4th next week and again after Wednesday, April the 18th. And if you've yet to switch, there is support and advice available, so you're not left in the dark as television in London embraces its digital future. Nick Thatcher, London Tonight, Crystal Palace. The horses that will escort the Queen during her Diamond Jubilee celebrations had a dress rehearsal today. 116 of the Queen's cavalry were up early and preparing for the day that they'll travel with Her Majesty from Westminster to Buckingham Palace in June. Rhea Chatterjee was up early with them. As the city woke up, so did the Queen's cavalry. Today's mission is the same as every other keep the regiment to exacting royal standards. At around eight o'clock, a familiar sound. The horses returning from their exercise routine. It's not just um, the horses that are prepared, it's obviously the kit that's prepared, the soldiers that have to be prepared. 
And preparation is mounting here at the Hyde Park barracks for a summer of state events. From putting their shoes on to making sure their tailor-made saddles are stitch perfect, it's all about pomp and circumstance. It's an amazing amount of preparation that goes on behind the scenes before a horse is allowed on parade. Um, for instance, the, the hooves are oiled up. Um, if, if the horse has white socks, um, they're then uh, 